slide down the mountain this morning just looking at God's great glory and beauty. It's just phenomenal. And then to come in and each and every song during praise music just overwhelm me. And of course, you know, I did get a little weepy. But you know, one of the things we talked about this weekend is where can you be your authentic self? Where better than the Church of Jesus Christ can you be vulnerable? Is there anybody here this morning who ever had a chance in town to change your life forever? Perhaps you saw that person that you had your arm around across the room. Or for some way or another, something happened down in the blue that you never dreamed would happen. Yeah. And your life has just changed forever. Nothing will ever be the same again. You'll never look at things through the same glasses. And so, I often say that in God's kingdom, there are no coincidences. I don't believe in coincidence. You know, people throw around words like kismet and karma and all those new agey kind of things that I just don't buy into. In the kingdom of God, there are no happenstance coincidences. Everything that happens in God's kingdom happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. Things happen for a reason, and I believe that that reason is all a part of God's master plan. Now, that's probably a whole sermon in itself, and we could go off on that rabbit trail if we wanted to sometime. You know, all about how did evil get into the world and how could death be a part of God's plan or how could heartache be a part of God's plan. But when we see the big picture, we know that it is. So many times we just have to accept that something in our lives is a result of just being a part of God's plan at that time. You know, sometimes people say, well, I was just in the right place at the right time, or I was just in the right place at the wrong time, or I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they think things just happen out of sheer luck or without design. But I don't believe that. I believe that everything that happens to us happens by design of a God who loves and cares for us more than any way we can imagine. Amen. And I think there's someone that could testify to that. Someone that can say, in God's kingdom there are no coincidences. And that is the man that we're going to talk about in our scripture lesson today. A man by the name of Zacchaeus. How many people went to the churches, as we call them this weekend, the sticky gold star churches, you know, where when you go to Sunday school, you've got the chart up on the wall, and everybody's name is listed. And if you brought your Bible, you got a gold star. If you were present, you got a gold star. If you brought your offering, you got a gold star. And we all wanted to see who could get the most gold stars. Who was going to be the best in God's eyes? Well, I'm here to tell you we're all equal in God's eyes. There are no gold stars. On God's chart. We've all got Amen. the same amount. Amen. But anyway, we all in those gold, sticky gold star churches learned about a little man called Zacchaeus. As a matter of fact, we even had a song we sang about Zacchaeus. We sang, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And when the Lord... And passing by, he looked up in that tree, and he yeah. said, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, come right down, because I'm going to your house today. <laughs> Our lesson this morning tells us that when Zacchaeus climbed in that tree that day, something happened. His life was never... Same again. Amen. Thank you, Guru. 
And when you meet Jesus Christ, no matter what else is going on in your life, your life will never be the same again. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I told you to talk to me this morning, so bear with me. You go, Pastor. If you want to follow <coughs> along with me, as we read our gospel lesson today, turn to the 19th chapter of Luke. I'm actually reading from the New Living Translation today, a translation that I love very much. And we're going to begin reading with verse 1 in the 19th chapter of Luke. I invite us all now to hear the word of God. Jesus entered Jericho, and he made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus, and he was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. Notice he wasn't just a tax collector, he was the chief tax collector. Now, we've talked about tax collectors before. We know that they made their living, they made their money by extorting large sums of money from people. Well, he was on up the pyramid. He was on up that pyramid scheme. Not only was he getting money from the people, his neighbors, and the people he was going to temple with, he was getting it from other tax collectors too because he was the chief tax collector. And he was a very wealthy man because of his greed and the things that he had done. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed the sycamore tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name, Zacchaeus. He said, quick, come down. I must be a guest at your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone on to be the guest of a notorious sinner. Not just a sinner, a notorious sinner. They grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and he said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today for this man, this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Amen. This ends the reading of our gospel lesson for today. This is the word of God and it can be trusted. Thanks be to God. I have to admit, I have loved this story from childhood. Not only because of the wonderful little song that went with it, but because of a life that was changed. You know, we just got back from our retreat. And it's a possibility that while we spent a couple of days in the mountains of North Carolina, there were some lives that might have been changed. You know, the design of the retreat is not to make people do a 180 degree change. It is not to make everybody do an about face and go, oh, I am changing the way I believe in this way. But it is designed to help people see things with a new perspective. A way to cause us to think about things that we have never thought about before. Or if we have thought about them, to look at them from a different angle. They're also intended to help all of us add a new layer to our spiritual death. Every time I think about the story of Zacchaeus, I remember the story I saw on the news once of a guy in California, and he was a sex offender that had been arrested. He had served his time. He had been rehabilitated, and he was released from prison after going through all that he was required to go through by law. His life had been changed. He had become a Christian. But you know, your past follows you sometimes, no matter what. And so this man moved into a neighborhood that was the right distance from schools and the right distance from churches. It was where the law said he could legally live. And 
He looked out his window, and people from the neighborhood were marching up and down, protesting. And of course, that brought out the news cameras. And so the news cameras come, and the reporters come up. And the reporters pull this one guy aside and begin interviewing him and asking him, why are y'all out here in front of this man's house? And he says, people like this have no right to live in my neighborhood. And the reporter came back and he said, well, he served his time. He has paid the price for his egregious crime. He has served his time. He has been rehabilitated. And he is living within the limits of where the law says he could live. So where would you suggest that this man live? And the man being interviewed told the reporter, he can go to hell for all I care. Jesus, friend of sinners. What about that point I'd say? You know, it could be any one of us, for any number of reasons, move into a neighborhood and somebody said they didn't want us to be there. But that's just not what God's kingdom is all about. And so I've tried to imagine that if Jesus had walked up to the house of that man, and invited himself in for dinner if he had pushed his way through the reporters and the protesters and walked straight up to the door and knocked on it and the man opens the door just a crack and looks out and Jesus says, I must come in and have dinner with you tonight. What would the protesters say? Would they be displeased? Would they grumble? Because Jesus was having dinner with a notorious sinner. Just a few thousand years different, that's all. The story of Zacchaeus is unique to the Gospel of Luke. Matthew, Mark, and John do not talk about Zacchaeus. It is strictly a Lucan thing. The story found only in that Gospel. It's perhaps because Luke always points out, being the physician that he was, that compassionate side of Jesus, and he shows the compassion that Jesus has for people who have been relegated to the margins of society, people who have been cast out of town, people who have been pushed to the side, that aren't as good as, that have been told all their life, you're not as good as You are less than. You are not worth it. And Jesus always finds them. He seeks them out. He goes to them. And he says, in my kingdom, you're worth it. Amen. Luke points out how Jesus breaks down barriers. How he reaches out in society to those folks who have been deemed by everyone else as unacceptable because they have self-appointed themselves as the authorities of polite society and the law and the way things should be done. But what Luke tells us, at least what I get from these stories that he tells us, is that God's love is for everybody. No one is excluded from the kingdom of God. Luke's Jesus is always right in the middle of the pain and the suffering, the searching and the longing of his audience. His love for us is so great that it constantly calls us down out of our trees, away from our boats, out of our comfort zones, and into his arms, and he sends us back out to share this love with our neighbors, even those who refuse to share it back with us. You see, the difficult part of all of this, as we talked about this weekend, is how will God's love for us change our lives? How can we be loved so much by God and not be changed? 
Because what we discovered this weekend, if you read Matthew 6 or Matthew 5, the Beatitudes is part of the Sermon on the Mount, we found out that birth can't be broken before you can ever be whole. You have to be broken before you can be whole. You have to mourn before you can be comforted and be happy. You have to mourn before you can be happy. And you have to be empty before you can be filled. You have to be empty before you can be filled. And here's another top one. You have to be authentic before you can be accepted. All right. That's how God changes lives. He turns our world upside down because the kingdom of God is upside down. The poor shall be rich, the rich shall be poor, the low shall be exalted, the high shall be lowered. So what do you think happened to Zacchaeus as he ate dinner with Jesus? Have you ever wondered what it would be like to sit across the dinner table for Jesus? Questions you would ask, things you would say. What do you think happened to Zacchaeus? Come on down to that tree, Zacchaeus, because I'm going to your house. You know he hadn't prepared dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, let's see what's in the cupboard. Oh, can I put it together for this Jesus? <laughs> Jesus is coming to my house. What am I going to fix? Meatloaf doesn't work. <laughs> can you imagine what it would be like to sit across the dinner table from Jesus. What was it that took the old Zacchaeus and turned him into the new Zacchaeus? The old Zacchaeus had gotten rich and taken people's money. But the new Zacchaeus says, Lord, I'm going to give half of everything I have to the poor. Half! Everything. I ain't holding back nothing. I'm giving half to the poor. And anybody that I cheated, I'm going to make it right. I don't care if I have anything in the end. It doesn't matter. Because I'm going to do what's right in your eyes. So what do you think Jesus said to him or did that caused him to have such a great change? If you ever have the opportunity to pick up the book called The Mirror by Lloyd Douglas, and he imagines people sitting across the table from Jesus. And Lloyd Douglas imagined that the conversation that Jesus with Zacchaeus had, and in the conversation, Jesus asked Zacchaeus what it is that made him desire the peace that he found at that table that night. And this is what Zacchaeus said, according to Lord Douglas in his book. He said that he saw himself mirrored in the eyes of Jesus. And he said, I saw the face of Zacchaeus the way I was meant to be, not the way that I am. I saw in the eyes of Jesus the way I was meant to be, not the way that I am. So if Jesus was sitting across the table from each of us having a conversation, what would we see mirrored in his eyes? You know, the love of God does not change us from who we are into a totally different person. but it does call from our soul the essence of who God created us to be. So no matter how many years and years and years of prayers I offered trying to be straight, I couldn't. I couldn't. Because when I sat across the table from Jesus and I looked in his eyes, You can't be anything else 
out to be on pivot. You are to be who I created you to be. Amen. The life has been so much better since we had that conversation. Amen. Thank you. God's law for us will not change. God's law for us will not change because we serve a God that is not changing. If there's any God out there that's being worshipped that's a changing God, don't worship them. If they can change their mind, if they can change the way they think about something, if they can change anything, they are not God. God is never changing. And any changing that goes on when we sit across the table from Jesus has to be us changing. Yes. We are the ones that have to change. Jesus does not change. So we need to get that part understood. Our God is not changeable. But we are. Amen. It's the power of God's love within each and every one of us that will bring about the change. If we're willing to tap into the source that is planted within our souls. Paul says in his letter to the Thessalonians, these words. So we keep on praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things that your faith prompts you to do. Then, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be honored in the way that you live. And you will be honored along with Him. And this is all made possible because of the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. When our lives are changed by God's love, it becomes evident in all the things that we say and do. And it's because of his love that we are compelled to change, that we're compelled to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Because of his love, we are compelled to change. Because of his love and the way we live our lives, it will be evident that God has changed us. Perhaps if we take a moment and look into Jesus' eyes this morning, we will see the reflection of the end of us and the beginning of Him. As we're broken, we hope. Mourn to be happy. Get empty to be filled and become authentic.